All right, welcome everyone to Scratching the Surface. Uh, we are going to be simulating Kubernetes today using the MIT Scratch programming language. Uh, and before you ask yourself why in the world would anyone simulate Kubernetes in the MIT Scratch programming language, uh, let's set some context as we get started. How many of you have ever uh, engaged with a getting started with Kubernetes guide, an intro guide that looked something like this? Okay, yeah, I see a couple hands. I think I've written a couple, so uh, guilty as charged. I don't want to shame or blame any of these. These are well-intentioned people. But I think that the key problem to most getting started guides that I read is that they are written by people a lot like me. My name is Mitch Connors. I'm a principal software engineer for Microsoft. I've been a maintainer on the Istio project for six years now, where I currently serve on the TOC. I'm also a CNCF ambassador, and that is a list of reasons why I should not be allowed to give an intro to Kubernetes talk. Uh, I have not been introed to Kubernetes in quite some time. I'm way too far down in the weeds, and I immediately want to tell you about how cool validating admission policies are. When you don't know what a pod is, they're not that cool. So what we need for a talk like this is someone who is indeed new to the community so that we can see Kubernetes through new eyes. Uh, I'm hopeful that this will help those of us who are new to KubeCon, new to Kubernetes, to understand some of the fundamentals of the project and how it works, what makes it great. But I'm also hopeful that for those of us who have been around in the community for quite a long time, this will give us a new perspective on what's important, what matters, and where the next generation will take Kubernetes. So for that, I'd like to invite my designated expert, non-expert, also my son, Jude Connors, up to the stage. And just for the audience's sake, Jude, did I make you do this? No. All right. Are you turned on on your mic there? OK, good. So Jude, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello, I'm Jude. I started coding about two years ago. Um, in my free time, I like to read books and play games. Currently, my favorite games are MTG and Warhammer. All right, we've got some fans in the room. That's good. And Jude, how many years of experience do you have with Kubernetes? None. OK. OK, well, then we're in the right place. There's a QR code on this slide. That's going to connect you to our uh, demo. And I'm going to keep it up for the next couple of slides. I always end up pointing it up and then moving off of that slide with about five seconds notice. So it's going to be there for a little bit. So Jude, to get us started, why don't you tell us if, in 30 seconds, what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes basically schedules different pods or programs to a variety of nodes or computers. So it's like a calendar app? No. Um, basically, once they're scheduled, the kubelet runs them on that computer, making it so that if one computer crashes, your entire application doesn't fail. OK, so a lot about resiliency, a lot about scale there. We'll be able to dig into those topics here in just a minute. As we get started, there's a few items of sort of vocabulary or foundational principles that we want to cover. Uh, and probably, oh, I haven't brought, Jude, can you go grab my backpack? Probably uh, a lot of you, when you got started in computer science, did you ever do the peanut butter and jelly experiment with your kids? You're going to act like a robot, and they're supposed to give you instructions for how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And usually the results, if it's done right, look something like what you have up on the screen. Uh, a, not all of this, but a lot of this is because humans have a hard time speaking the way that computers expect us uh, or to speak. Uh, typically, computer APIs have been written imperatively. That means you tell them what to do, and they will do it whether it was a good idea or not, regardless of what you told them to do before or not. Uh, Kubernetes is not imperative. Kubernetes is declarative. And that's a little bit of a hard concept to wrap our heads around. So to get started, uh, we're going to give an example of a declarative API versus an imperative API. Dude, can you open that? Got here we've got a Captain Cube, and we've got some Kubernetes, ping, the ping pong ball. They've got Kubernetes pickleball now. I'm still waiting for Kubernetes, the flamethrower, to show up in the CNCF store. Come on. Ask Elon if he can spot us a couple. 
All right, so Jude, I want you to do everything I tell you to in imperative mode. So go ahead and uh, hang on to this ball for me. Hold this ball for me. Hold this ball for me. Hold this for me. All right, so Jude did exactly what I told him to do uh, and nothing that I expected. Uh, any parent giving instructions to their children would have been very frustrated with that interaction, right? We've got some corrective action to take. So humans tend to speak a bit more declaratively, and we tend to use the word let uh, when we talk about declarative APIs. So Jude, don't let Captain Cube hit the floor. Don't let this ball hit the floor. Don't let this ball hit the floor. Don't let this ball hit the floor or this ball hit the floor. Good luck. That's declarative mode. I've given Jude rules. And you notice, Jude had to switch hands a couple of times there. He had to load balance between uh, the resources that he had, you might say. There was some scheduling going on. Uh, Jude did whatever it took to make the rules that I gave true. Uh, eventually, I could have given him so many ping pong balls, and I, I brought another thing of them, that uh, they just spill all over the floor because there's just not enough hands to keep them from falling on the floor. He'd need to get some help in fulfilling those rules. But that's how a declarative API works, and that's going to be a core concept for Kubernetes. All right, so uh, anybody somewhere that I can throw want a Captain Cube? Here we go. I'd throw ping pong balls, but I think they won't make it past the first row. I should have planned this out. Let's see here. Oh, just to the first row. Well, you can come up and grab a ping pong ball afterwards. I don't need to demonstrate my lack of throwing skills for you all. All right, another core concept that we're going to need to talk about, not core to Kubernetes, but core to what we're doing today, is Scratch. So Scratch is a graphical programming language developed by MIT to help students get an introduction to software engineering without necessarily having to know how to type to read complex curly braces and square braces and parentheses uh, to tell what a tilde is, et cetera. Uh, so it's a great way for kids to get started building Kubernetes, or uh, sorry, no, building video games. Not such a great way to get started building a Kubernetes simulator. And after Jude and I wrote the CFP, we actually found there was some functionality that was missing. So I want to introduce you to Berkeley Snap. Snap started as a plugin for Scratch that allowed you to create custom blocks, and over time it evolved in 2014. They actually forked the project all together. As you can see, it's very similar to the Scratch programming environment, just with more functions that you're able to make use of. So uh, we're not going to be using MIT Scratch as advertised. Sorry to disappoint you all. We're going to be using Snap. That being said, updating the talk name to Snapping the Surface just really didn't have the same ring to it, so we've gone ahead and left it as is. We're going to tackle Kubernetes across three modules this morning. We're going to talk about the scheduler, the replicator, and the deployment. Last couple of things before we get started, we can deep dive into each of these modules and their code. Uh, there's a, we need to set some expectations. Um, if you thought that you were going to see running containers and REST servers implemented in Kubernetes or implemented in MIT Scratch, I want to apologize right now. <laughs> this is a simulator, not a re-implementation. Uh, this will not pass the Kubernetes conformance tests in any way, shape, or form. The purpose here is rather to demonstrate to you how Kubernetes responds to different situations. So to that end, we're not using YAML to declare any of our objects or anything along those lines. We're simply starting with the objects themselves to understand what does Kubernetes do. We can get into namespacing and labeling, et cetera, later on. Uh, because Scratch lacks strong typing, we've got some kind of interesting code uh, in a couple of places where we just iterate over all objects. Uh, you'll see those later on. And then, of course, uh, there's very little room on a Scratch screen. It's 480 pixels by 360 pixels. There's really not a lot of room to give a complex user interface. Uh, and so we've gone ahead and dropped the status field, even though that's a very important part of a de declarative API. You write your intent to spec. You get what is actually happening back in the status. Uh, we're going to be showing what is actually happening graphically on the screen for us all. So hopefully this is a simulation will be realistic enough to get the principles across for new users. All right, uh, hopefully this is my last slide. I'm talking too much here. Brief tour of the code base. Each of these are functions that we built. Uh, along the left side, you see mostly functions that I built. I designed our object model, getters, setters, etc. All of the really boring boilerplate that no 14-year-old wants to spend three hours of his time doing, uh, I went ahead and laid out. And then I handed those objects 
and getters and setters over to Jude to implement the actual business logic. So on the right side, you see something, uh, pick node for a pod. Uh, you see, let's see, what else do we have? Schedule a pod, update the replica set, uh, the replicas on a replica set. Those are all functions that Jude took care of writing. Those are effectively the business logic, not the object model. All right, and with that, I think we're ready to talk about the scheduler. So Jude, why don't you take us through what is the scheduler's job? What are the different terms that we need to know to understand the scheduler? Well, the scheduler assigns different pods to nodes. Again, the pod is the code and the node is the computer. Um, once they're assigned, the kubelet runs the pods and immutable just means like they can't be affected or changed at all. Okay, so if you, if you put a pod on a node and you don't like something about it, what do you need to do? Uh, you have to delete the pod and reschedule another one. Okay, okay. And the kubelet's job? The kubelet runs the code on the node. Okay, so the scheduler assigns to a node, the kubelet then is the one that executes that assignment? Yeah. Sounds good. A couple of exceptions to, to what we're gonna show off here. Uh, for pod, we're only showing two properties, name and size. Name approximates what the pod's going to be doing, and the size replaces our compute requirements. Normally we would express these as requests for CPU and memory or even limits on how much it can claim. Uh, for the demo's sake, we're only using one dimension, and if you're familiar with what the latest developments in the Kubernetes ecosystem, it's gonna be more than two-dimensional in the future. So using an approximation of that is, a, is a, I think, a good idea for the demo. And once again, we're not actually executing any containers here. Container D is not involved. Uh, with that said, Jude, why don't you take us through the code? You can walk over there. So, set pod to new pod basically is just creating the pod, and then pick node for pod is looking around, seeing what nodes have space for a pod of this size. Uh, ask node for my lowest pod bottom is checking just to lay it out so if there's more than one pod inside a node, they go underneath each other and they're not overlapping or anything like that. If node equals zero, that means there aren't any nodes, so the pod is unschedulable and we delete it. Um, and that unschedulable, by the way, is one area where status would normally come into play we would write to the pod status that it's unschedulable and that's how you'd know that you're not able to execute that pod. Again, we don't have status, so we just go ahead and remove the pod from the simulation. Then on the right side is the assigning it and having it go to its node, uh, writing the pod's name, um, yeah. Okay, so this is sort of an interesting thing here. The, the business logic is really creating a new pod and picking a new node. All the other lines of code that you see here, all the other blocks that are laid out, are just about laying the pod out, getting it to be the right height to represent its size, getting it to sit with its node. It turns out Scratch and Snap are really good at games where little characters bump into each other on the screen and cause effects on one another. They're not so good at diagramming, uh, having a large box contain a smaller box, writing its name on, things like that. So you're gonna see a lot of UI layout code here. Uh, Jude, are you ready to take us through the demo? Yeah. Oh, no, apparently you're not, sorry. Uh, we did some hand waving there. Pick node for was actually the most interesting function on the page. So let's drill down and see how do we pick a node for a pod. Pick a node for the pod, basically we put all the nodes into a list. And for each node we check, does it have space to run a pod of this size? It, for all the nodes that do, we add to another list and we take a random number from that list um, and that's the node that the pod is assigned to. If there are no nodes, then the pod is unschedulable. And uh, in the case of unschedulable, we ran into another sharp edge. No concept of null or nil in Scratch. Totally get why they wouldn't put that into a children's programming language, but it sure would have been useful for us. Uh, so you're gonna see zeros used all over the place in lieu of null because there's no strong typing and we can set it to whatever we want to. All right, Jude, why don't you take us through the demo here? I'll get you over just the Scratch environment. Oops, we should reset that, have reset that. Let's clear that out. Clear that out. There you go. All right, so I'll name the node node one. 
node size will be five. And then I'll create another one. So now the, the node is as long as it is because of its size. If we were to create a node of size one, it should be one fifth as long. Yeah. So node two, nope, that's not a two. <laughs> node two, size three, and you can see it's smaller. Then if we create a pod, we'll call it pod one, and I'll give it size six. So there's not space for it, so the pod is unschedulable and doesn't show up. But if I make it smaller, pod two. It's not a typing test, you're okay. Yes, but I like it being better. Pod two, four, and then it does end up fitting. It went to node one because it doesn't fit in node two. All right. Very nice. Okay, so that's our scheduler demo, and it really is as simple as all that at a high level in Kubernetes. The scheduler's job is just to assign to the correct, uh, assign each pod that's created to the correct node. And if that were all Kubernetes was, uh, I think that we probably would not all be here this week. Uh, because any of us can look at a fleet of computers and pick a particular one to run a pod. So let's go ahead and move into our next module, module two, where we're going to cover the replicator. Jude, do you want to lay out sort of at a high level, what does the replicator do and what are, what's the terminology we need to understand here? A replica set is, it basically creates a bunch of identical pods and assigns them to a variety of different nodes. And replicas, are basically the number of pods it creates. All right. Uh, and uh, sharp edges here before we get going on the demo. We don't have a way to show a replica set, but that's fine because what our simulator is showing is nodes and pods. So you're going to see the effect of a replica set in our simulator. But not having it in the UI means there's no way to modify it. Uh, as you saw, we were crowded out with buttons already. So. Uh, we're going to cover modifying replica sets a little bit in the next module with deployments. We'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, and I know we, we call this the replicator. Kubernetes calls it the replication controller, but replicator sounds a lot cooler. Uh, so if you want to petition the uh, SIG app to rename replication controller to replicator, you all have a GitHub issue you can go ahead and give a thumbs up to there. Um, the last is that within this uh, demo, we don't really have the ability to watch individual objects. In Kubernetes, the replicator is going to be aggressively watching its own pods to make sure that there's always the number of them that it ex expects to exist. Uh, however, in our demo, that's a little bit more nuanced than we can achieve. So we simply have a global broadcast uh, that we, that's called Reconcile that lets all of the controllers know they should read their intended state, their actual state, and take steps towards the intended state. Uh, so it's a little bit of a, a sharp edge for our demo. That being said, Jude, why don't you take us through the code? Okay. So we're setting diff to replicas minus the length of pods. Um, that means that's how many pods we want to have, but we don't. And so we repeat diff times, we're scheduling a pod. Um, if diff is less than zero, then that means we have too many pods. So multiply by negative one to make it a positive number. And we are removing pods from nodes now because we have too many. So you're saying like everything at the bottom of the screen there is all about removing a pod. More, more graphical layout code there. Uh, again, business objects were not meant to be implemented in Scratch. We're really abusing it at this point. All right. Uh, I think that's all of the code. So shall we get to the demo? Let's see the replicator in action. Okay. So if I clear that, create more nodes. And another one. And then I'm creating a replica set. I'll have pod size three, and I'll create three pods. Ooh, we didn't get three pods there. What's going on? So currently, there's not enough room to run all three pods. So OK. So what we need to do is make more room and then run the replicator again. 
Uh, no, we broadcast reconcile, and then it will take care of all the pods we don't have. OK, show us. So if I create another node, still nothing's happened. But if I broadcast reconcile, then you'll see another pod shows up. All right, so this shows off the difference between a declarative and an imperative API in Kubernetes. If this had been an imperative API, we would have told it, make three pods. It would have tried, it would have failed on the third one, and then later on when there is room, nothing would have changed. We would have to tell it to make another pod again. We would need something to understand that difference. Instead, we said, let there be three pods. And so even when it couldn't fulfill the rule, it kept trying. And when there be finally became capacity, we were able to fulfill our expectations for replica sets. And this is fundamental to 95% of applications that run on Kubernetes are going to be using the replica set controller under the hood, but they're not going to be using replica set controller directly. Uh, if you're doing GitOps, you should almost never see a replica set stored in YAML. Uh, and the reason is we have another demo to cover, another module, that is the deployment. Jude, can you take us through what is the deployment controller's job and what are the terms that we need to understand here? The deployment is basically a replica set, but you can change what it, what's inside of it. And once you make that change, it slowly shifts from the old one to the new. And how's that different from what replica set would do if I changed something there? Uh, with replica set, if you change it, it'll just instantly delete all the old ones and spin up some new ones. Sounds like a great strategy for production, right? And if somebody wanna have delete all my apps before deploying the new ones? Okay, so deployment controller has been around for a long time. It sits on top of replica set. A uh, couple of sharp edges here. In Kubernetes, the deployment doesn't just wait to know that a pod exists, because remember, pods can exist and be unschedulable. That's not terribly helpful. In Kubernetes, it's gonna wait for the pod to exist and be ready, and each pod gets to define what readiness looks like for itself. Readiness should be approximately, I'm actually serving traffic. I'm doing whatever my job is as a piece of software. Uh, we don't have pod read readiness. We're not running containers. There's no HTTP happening in the background here. So we're gonna keep it pretty simple and approximate readiness with pod existence. The other sharp edge which you've been seeing all along is we are interacting with our Kubernetes simulator through some buttons on a screen. That will almost certainly not be the way that you interact with Kubernetes, whether you're in development or in production. Touching a Kubernetes cluster usually looks like using the cube cuddle tool. Is that right, Jude? Cube cuddle? Yeah. Or cube control? <laughs> It was a long-standing debate in the community. It stands for cube control, but cube cuddle just rolls off the tongue so much easier, and it lets me put fun pictures of cats cuddling cubes into my slideshows. So we're gonna stick with cuddling cubes for this, uh, for this demo. You guys can pronounce it differently if you like. Let's get to the code. Jude, take us through this. If new rs equals zero, that means there are, new repli or there are no replica sets currently, so we create a new replica set. Otherwise, if the name of the replica set we're trying to make does not equal the name of our current replica set, we set our current replica set to old replica set and create a new new replica set. Now, why would the name change? Um, whenever we edit anything inside of the pod, any of its characteristics, its version also changes, which is a part of its name. Inside of the deployment, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, keep going for us. Uh, if replicas is greater than current replicas, that means we want more replicas than we have, then we just spin up more replicas. Uh, if we have too many replicas and there are old replicas, that means we start getting rid of old replicas. And if, there, um, if we have too many replicas, otherwise if we have too many replicas, we'll start taking away from the new replica set meaning we scale slowly from one to the other. And if old replicas is less than one, then we get rid of it because we don't need it anymore. What's this last block? So if you've gotten down to this very bottom block where you're updating to new replicas plus one, you've already determined that you have exactly as many replicas as you want between old and new, so why would you add one? Because that helps scale from the old to the new, if you're adding one new one, that means you have too many, so you take away one of the old ones. Okay, so we're gonna say, if we have like, say, four, we're gonna go with one new and four old, 
then one new and three old, then two new and three old, then two new and two old, like that? Yeah. Okay. Can you show us how it works in action? Oh, let's, one moment here. So that you don't have to watch us painstakingly create a bunch of nodes, we have a little helper function for our demo. There we go. So we've got a four node cluster, looks like uh, some nodes of size four, size five, size six. Jude, show us what the deployment's gonna do. All right, so I'm naming it, set the size, and set how many I want. Now, nothing's happened yet because we haven't broadcasted reconcile with the deployment. So if I do that, you'll see we created the ones we need. Okay, so we asked for three of size three, and we got that. Now, now in this case, we have a little bit of an interesting thing. Once again, it's hard to show modifying objects uh, through such a primitive user interface. So we've got a function uh, bound to a key here that is going to take the deployment, and we're gonna change the size of the deployment to, to plus one from where we're gonna increment it by one. And that'll show us the process of a replica set rolling out those new versions. Jude, why don't you take us through that? So currently, nothing's happened yet, but if I broadcast reconcile, we add a new one, then we're slowly scaling down from the old, and now we have all three with the new size. Okay, so a progressive rollout from large to new, and just like with replica set, if we hadn't had enough space to spin up everything we wanted, uh, the deployment controller would sit there waiting, and it'd keep trying until we finally did have space to achieve our desired result. Okay, so that's our last demo. Let me switch back to our slideshow real quickly. Uh, if we had 30 more minutes with you, uh, we would cover how services and endpoints and gateways, stateful sets, config maps uh, work in Kubernetes. But all of these concepts build on top of the foundational ideas you've seen today. So if you're new in the community, I'm hopeful that between understanding the scheduler, the replicator, and the deployment controller, you'll have a foundation to engage in conversations about the thousand other amazing things that you can do with Kubernetes. I would also be remiss in doing a tech talk with my son if I didn't spend some time teaching him to chop wood and carry water. Uh, Scratch and Snap really don't have any kind of a testing system that I could find that's available to users. So we went ahead and implemented one. You may have seen it a little bit earlier on the screen. We put it inside of a whole bunch of if blocks with manual switch toggles so that you can turn them on or off whenever you start it. We run tests on the replication controller as well as on the deployment controller, making sure we've always got the expected number because let me tell you, we broke this demo a lot <laughs> as we were working through. So the test gave us great feedback and helped us to uh, earn the favor of the demo gods this morning, which I'm very thankful for. So that is our talk. You can uh, give us feedback with the QR code on the right. You can try it out for yourself with the QR code on the left. And we do still have six minutes for questions. Hi there, thanks, thanks for doing this. I don't have a question, this was freaking brilliant. <laughs> It's absolutely brilliant because we've been trying to figure out a way to teach these concepts in our company. We will absolutely go this route. It's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Way to go. Yeah, up front. The truth is that we didn't diligently not rename anything the same, and what happens is extraordinarily confusing. Uh, Scratch and, and Snap don't have any way to introspect a running process. Uh, there's pause, there's a breakpoint that you can use, but you can't inspect any variables <laughs> or see any internal state. Uh, so when it misbehaves, you are limited very much to the print statement, which is effectively like those questions you saw it asking at the bottom of the screen for each prompt. Uh, in order to figure out what the internal state is. How, dude, how many times did we get bit by that? Many. Uh, even, even, <laughs> the, even when you use like a function parameter or, or a custom block that has a name and you're calling it from a sprite that has a variable of that same name, it seems to be completely non-deterministic which one of those values it's gonna refer to. Um, so, it, you know, we're abusing the system quite a bit here. Uh, and that was actually, those experiments were what led to the need for unit tests. <laughs> Another question in the back? Yeah, so I, I love this. Um, you might consider looking at uh, App Inventor, just a little bit more 
sophisticated environment for kids as, as well. We can make mobile apps and much more sophisticated uh, UI. I'm actually struggling to hear you. The speakers are pointed your direction. Sorry about that. Oh, so you might consider looking to App Inventor, MIT App Inventor. It's like Scratch. It's for kids, oh. but you can make mobile apps with a much, which, with a much better UI. I will have to check that out. Maybe uh, maybe next year's KubeCon can see a demo there. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody. It was great for you to come out.